It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, first question is to the Acting Premier. As Acting OPP Commissioner Brad Blair showed incredible integrity and courage standing up for the independence of the Ontario Provincial Police and standing up to the Premier when he tried to install his friend Ron Tavener as the Commissioner of the OPP, why did the Premier have him fired? The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. I uh, will once again reiterate, Mr. Blair's employment with the OPP was terminated as a result of a nine-member Deputy Minister Committee of the Public Service Commission. To be clear, that recommendation to terminate his employment was in consultation with the Commissioner Gary Couture. No one is above the law, whether you are a constable or a Deputy Commissioner. Order. You swear an oath, Speaker, to uphold the laws of our province. Position Mr. come to order. Blair breached his duties as both a police officer and a public service. That is why the recommendation was made to terminate his employment, and that is what, why his OIC was rescinded. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, for months, the Premier and the ministers forced to defend his actions insisted that hiring the Premier's oldest friend as Commissioner was a coincidence yep. and that buying off an off-the-books van with a reclining leather couch was a cost-saving measure. Now they want to attack a dedicated career officer who had the courage to both blow the whistle on this government. Why should anyone believe that this is anything but the Premier trying to settle the score? Minister. Speaker, I think in the interest of clarity, we better uh, read from the dismissal letter that was sent to Brad Blair, which was made public earlier today. And I will quote, you have no authority to unilaterally disclose confidential government emails in furtherance of your personal interns. Quote, the disclosure is both a contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation made under the PSOA and a violation of your oath of office you took as a public service. Quote, it is a clear attempt to use your professional status to further your private interests by implying that the legal activities in which you are engaged are a party of your official duties and or sanctioned by the OPP. This individual chose to sully the reputation of the Response. excellent OPP officers who serve our public and, and the people of Ontario. He was terminated as a result. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, every PC MPP should take a moment to ask themselves if their constituents sent them here so that the Premier could install his personal friend into the top job running the OPP and fire anyone who doesn't side, agree with him. Maybe it was because Brad Blair blew the whistle on political interference. Maybe it was because he said the OPP wouldn't make off-the-books purchases for the Premier. Maybe it was because the Premier was worried about the investigation into the the 407 data breach. Yeah. But people deserve answers. Answers this government has not provided. Will the government call a public inquiry today to clear the air and give people the answers that they deserve? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Again, in the interest of clarity, I will confirm Mr. Blair's employment was determined. Uh, as a result of a nine-member Public Service Commission decision. That recommendation was accepted. We have now uh, moved forward. We need to ensure that the integrity of the OPP, the integrity of the people who choose to serve Opposition come in to order. our Ontario Provincial Police and in the OPS, are prepared to withhold and prepare to make sure that they prepare their oath of office. We have individuals in the OPP who are excellent, and yet we have an individual who chose to, and I will quote again, you have no authority to unilaterally disclose confidential government emails in furtherance of your public Response. interest. He was terminated as a result of a recommendation from the, the Public Service Commission that led to a revocation of his order in council. It's done. 
We need to move on. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Acting Premier. I think it's shocking that the Minister says it's done. Nothing to see here. This thing reeks. It reeks like a stinking mess, and this government needs to clean it up, Speaker. They need to clean it up. The OPP says that the Acting Commissioner, Brad Blair, was fired on the orders of Mario Di Tommaso, Ron Tavener's former colleague and the man who changed the OPP Commissioner job description in order to lower the bar so that Ron Tavener could qualify to apply. But yesterday, the Minister Government of Community and Safety uh, claimed that the decision was made by the Public Service Commission in consultation with the OPP independently. Whose version is accurate, Speaker? The Minister's or the Ontario Poli Provincial Police's. And the Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Speaker, you know, the leader of the NDP can't have it both ways. You ask for an independent public service. You ask that there is no involvement and intervention. And yet, when I explain the process, when I talk about the Ontario Public Service, the commission that made the decision to terminate Mr. Blair's employment with the Ontario Public Service and the OPP, you are suggesting that in some way we now need to get involved. I vehemently disagree. I support the Ontario Public Service. I support the recommendation, and I am happy to endorse that. Members, please take your seat. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I dare say the minister and her premier better figure out whether this was a political political appointment or it wasn't. They can't have it both ways, Speaker. Yesterday, the minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services said that her deputy minister, Ron Tavener's friend, Mario Di Tommaso, recommended the termination of Brad Blair, and the minister claimed she didn't ask why Mario Di Tommaso was doing this. Supposedly, he didn't give her his reasons for wanting to fire Brad Blair, but she approved the decision anyway. Yeah. Why would the minister approve terminating an OPP deputy commissioner without seeking any explanation yeah. or rationale for the decision? Minister? I you don't understand how government works. Speaker, in the interest of clarity, again, I will read from the dismissal le uh, letter given to Mr. Blair. Quote, you have no authority to unilaterally disclose confidential government emails in furtherance of your personal interests. Quote, the disclosure Opposition is both come to order. contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation made under the PSOA and a violation of the oath of office you took as a public service. Quote, it is a clear attempt to use your professional status to further your private interest by implying that the legal activities in which you are engaged are a party of your official duties and or sanctioned by the OPP. Quote, this is also a contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation. Quote, you have acted in a manner that is incompatible with the faithful discharge of your position as a public service. Enough said. While the Ford government says the OPP decided to fire the acting commissioner, Brad Blair, the OPP says it was the decision coming from Mario Di Tommaso, the deputy minister, who is also a friend of Ron Tavener's. The Premier has been saying for months that Brad Blair should be punished for speaking out. Can the acting Premier tell us, did the Premier or his chief of staff have any conversations about this matter with the deputy minister before he recommended the firing? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I, I'm going to repeat this in the interest of ensuring that everybody is clear. No one is above the law, whether you are a constable or a deputy commissioner. You swear an oath to uphold the laws of this province. Mr. Blair's employment was terminated as a result of the Public Service Commission nine-member committee. This action was taken in consultation with the OPP Commissioner Couture. I think that it is 
perfectly appropriate that someone that used their uniform and position as a deputy commissioner yep. to further his own personal gain yep. violated the use, the, the use of his office and, frankly, sullies the reputation of every excellent OPP Opposition officer come to order. who serves the province of Ontario and the people of Ontario. We need to make sure that the people who yep. choose to serve in our Ontario Public Service and with the OPP Response. respect that oath of office. That is what the Commission has done by terminating his employment. Thank you, Speaker. Start the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the Acting Premier. The Deputy OPP Commissioner was ultimately terminated through an order in Council, an order in Council that was signed by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Did anyone, did anyone in the Cabinet ask any questions about Brad Blair's termination before signing the order in Council that removed him, or are we supposed to believe that the Premier asked no questions about this unprecedented termination? Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. I think, um, I think in the interests of clarifying process, uh, it is important to note that the order in council occurred after Mr. Blair was terminated as a deputy commissioner for the OPP. You cannot have a order in council of an individual who is no longer actively engaged in the role as commissioner of the OPP. That is why the recommendation was made to me as minister to revoke the order in council. After the termination occurred on Monday order. morning, we revoked the order in council as was appropriate. Thank you. The Premier has claimed that it was a remarkable coincidence that his oldest friend was awarded the job of OPP Commissioner, even though he wasn't qualified to even apply for the initial posting. Now he expects us to believe that impartial civil servants and the OPP decided spontaneously to terminate the decorated officer that the Premier has been complaining about for months. Why won't the Premier stop asking people to believe the unbelievable and put all the facts on the table with a public inquiry? That's what the people of this province deserve. That's what this government should do. It's the only way, the only way to get to the bottom of this cesspool. Members, take your seats. Minister. Look, it's, uh, it's pretty clear that the individual who did not ultimately get the offer of employment to serve as the OPP commissioner is a little angry. But that in no way excuses him and allows him to be above the law. So again, the dismissal letter sent to Mr. Blair, which was made public today, and I quote, you have an authority to you do not have an authority to unilaterally disclose confidential government emails in furtherance of your personal interests. Quote, the disclosure is both a contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation made under the PSOA and a violation of your oath of office you took as a public servant. Quote, it is a clear attempt to Response. use your professional status mm -hmm. to further your personal interests by implying that the legal activities in which you are engaged are party of your official duties and are sanctioned by the OPP. Thank you. A little caution, the opposition members. Some of the interjections are dangerously close to the line of acceptability or unacceptability in terms of parliamentary language. Next question, the member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Speaker, I know from listening to students and families that skyrocketing fees for university and college in Ontario became increasingly unaffordable under the previous Liberal government. In fact, since 2006, undergraduate Tuition for Ontarians has risen from an average of $5,000 to almost $9,000. And so my classmates at Brock University have been clear to me that a sustainable, 
and affordable post-secondary education is crucial to them and their future. Can the minister tell us what steps this government is taking to make university and college affordable for students and their families? Minister for Training, Colleges and Universities. And thank you to the member from Niagara West for the question. Speaker, for years, student groups and even the opposition have been calling for tuition relief from unsustainable student fees, tuition fees. Yep. And our government is taking unprecedented steps to provide tuition fee relief. And for the first time in Ontario's history, we'll be reducing tuition fees across the board by 10 percent. And speaker, the NDP is more concerned about the ability of institutions to handle a 3 percent reduction in funding. We are focused on delivering a total of $450 million in tuition relief to students and their families. In addition to this historic reduction, we are creating a student choice initiative. This initiative will allow students to choose whether or not to support optional fees so they can find additional savings. Response. Speaker, our government is putting students first by making post-secondary education more affordable and putting more money back in their pockets. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you also to the Minister for that response. Speaker, it's shameful, shameful that under the previous Liberal government, tuition was allowed to skyrocket. Since 2006, undergraduate for tuitions, for, uh, tuition for Ontarians has risen from an average of $5,000 to almost $9,000. But I know that many professional degrees, including medical degrees, computer science and business degrees, are even more expensive for students. I know that the 10 percent reduction and Student Choice Initiative will see particularly large savings for students and families in those programs. And so can the minister tell us how many how many how much students in my riding could save in these programs because of our government's historic action? Minister Thank you again to the member of the question. Speaker, the member is right to say that students and families will see real and substantial savings from our 10 percent tuition reduction. In the member's riding, a student studying game development at Niagara College will save $560, $650, even more, next year, thanks to our government's changes. A student studying an undergraduate degree of commerce and business at Brock University will save $890 next year, and a student studying a Master's of Education at Brock will save $1,200. Speaker, we were elected on a promise to put more money back in people's pockets, and through our historic tuition reduction and our Student Choice Initiative, we are doing just that. Thank you. The next question is from the member for Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Through you to the Acting Premier. Speaker, was Acting OPP Commissioner Brad Blair fired for telling the people of Ontario that the current part-time Premier requested an off-the-books purchase of a special luxury van complete with a reclining couch, a bar fridge, and a widescreen TV? The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Mr. Blair's employment with the Ontario Provincial Police was terminated because no one is above the law. Whether you are a constable or a deputy commissioner, you swear an oath to uphold the laws of this province. He chose not to do that when he didn't get the job that he wanted. A decision was made by the Public Service Commission to terminate his employment. That is what happened in full consultation with the OPP Commissioner Couture. Supplementary. It's your premier that's got the integrity problem. Speaker, that truly is some Trudeau-level spin coming out of this minister. <laughs> Speaker, Brad Blair. Brad Blair didn't have a lot to gain from blowing the whistle on this premier, but the premier had everything to gain from firing Brad Blair. He could. He could clear the way for his appointment of his friend, Ron Tavener, as commissioner. He could get his luxury van complete with reclining couch, bar fridge and widescreen TV. Speaker, our part-time premier has a proven track record of threatening Brad, Brad Blair. So when the premier said that this has nothing No, you can't impute motive. I'd ask the member to put his question without imputing motive. 
Speaker, I withdraw. Speaker, when the Premier says that this has nothing to do with him, why should anyone in Ontario believe him? Minister, please take your seat. Speaker, the difference between Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau, and Premier Ford is Premier Ford stands behind the women in his cabinet and supports them. Again, I will quote from the dismissal letter sent to Brad Blair, which he made public yesterday. Quote, you have no authority to unilaterally disclose confidential government emails in furtherance of your personal interests. Quote, the disclosure is both a contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation made under the PSOA and a violation of the oath of office you took as a public servant. Quote, it is a clear attempt Response. to use your professional status to further your private interests by implying that the legal activities in which you are engaged are party to your official duties and are sanctioned by the OPP, which they were not clearly. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barrie Springwater Oral Medonte. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, our PC government was elected on a promise to make life easier for the people of Ontario. For 15 years, the Liberal Party, with the support of the NDP, nickel and dimed Ontarians. They were more concerned with finding ways to raise taxes than with how to make life more affordable. Under the leadership of our Premier, it's a new day in Ontario. Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry has been hard at work to make hunting and angling more affordable for the people of my riding, after the Liberals ignored them for 15 years. Recently, the Minister announced that hunting and fishing license fees would be frozen. Mr. Speaker, my question for the Minister is, how much of the money will this initiative put back in the pockets of the folks in Barrie, Springwater, or Medante who fish in Lake Simcoe and Orr Lake? <laughs> Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Barry Springwater, or Madonti, for the question and his great service to his riding. We're making life easier for hunters and fishers by putting more money back into their pockets. These are great sports enjoyed by people all across Ontario. It's also a big driver of our economy, particularly in rural communities. With our PC government, Ontario is finally open for business and open for jobs. Cancelling the Liberals' previously approved fee increases of two, two, two dollars of service fee increases plus the license fee increase themselves will make hunting and fishing more accessible to people all across Ontario so they can contribute to their local economy by spending more money on the things that matter to them. Perhaps more money at the bait shop, perhaps more money at the tackle shop. Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the member that this initiative will put $4.3 million not into the government's pockets, but back into the people, here, here. pockets of the people of Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I'm always glad to hear how committed the minister is to making life easier for hunters and anglers by putting more money in their pockets. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate that the NDP decided to support the Liberals for 15 years while the cost of day-to-day -day life became more than Ontarians could bear. However, it's clear the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and our government have the right priorities for the people of Ontario with common sense initiatives like this. Mr. Speaker, I know the decision to exempt veterans and active Canadian Armed Force members who enjoy recreational fish fishing from needing a fishing license was also very well received by my constituents, including my friend Aaron Gerb. Ontario is finally on the right track, Mr. Speaker. Can the minister elaborate on the significance of hunting and fishing for Ontario's economy? Minister. Speaker, I want to thank the member again for supplementary, and we were very proud, very proud as the government for the people to exempt veterans and active servicemen from uh, service people from their fishing license fees. Ontario is recognized as a destination for both hunting and fishing, and the impact that it has on our tourism industry is significant. We have a bountiful 
uh, amount of natural resources, and we want people from everywhere to take advantage of that. Recreational fishing alone is a $2.2 billion industry here in the province of Ontario that contributes so much to the local economies, particularly in rural Ontario. Hunting is also over a $400 million business here in the province of Ontario. So when we can have people enjoying those uh, pursuits, those sports, particularly with their families, and we can reduce or eliminate additional costs to make them more accessible. That's what we do in Ontario because this government Spons. of the people wants to do the things that the people care about here, here, in the here, province here. of Ontario. We need to stop the clock. Members will take their seats, start the clock. The member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. I've been traveling the province where hundreds of families have come out to town halls. We've heard from parents who are being flat out denied enrollment for their children with autism at their local public schools. We're hearing warnings from experts that improper transition out of therapy and into schools is damaging, and parents are feeling the pressure and anxiety of what lies ahead. Families from all across the province are coming to the front lawn of Queen's Park on Thursday to make their voices heard. Who from this government will come out and speak to them to justify their autism program? Questions for the Deputy Premier. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, um, and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. The system for autism services that our government inherited from the previous Liberal government was both unfair and unsustainable. Currently, just 2,400 children are waiting for a diagnostic assessment. However, Speaker, more than 23,000 children are presently on the waiting list. Just 8,400 children uh, are receiving the Order. crucial help that they need, which means, Speaker, that three out of four children, and you know, I, I really wish the, the, the government or the opposition would understand that what's happening is three out of four are languishing on the wait list. Our government and our minister made a decision that we Response. didn't want that to happen, that we wanted to reform the system, and that's exactly what our government is going to do. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, back to the Deputy Premier, who used to care about this file. Oh. Yesterday, yesterday it was the member from Carleton giving parents false hope. Today, I'd like to share the finance minister's previous words of support. Quote, this government has a responsibility to ensure individuals with autism can realize their full potential. Instead, after years of waste, scandal, and mismanagement, the Premier is attempting to balance the budget on the backs of the most vulnerable. End quote. Mr. Vic Fidelli in 2016. Whoa. I couldn't have said once again, I'll remind all members we refer to each other by our riding names or a ministerial name if the person's in the cabinet. Please, your question. Mr. Speaker, sorry. I couldn't have said it better myself, and I wonder if the minister still agrees with himself. Will the question. acting premier encourage her members to join parents on the front lawn? Perhaps the minister of finance or the member from Carleton? You can refer to the minister of municipal affairs and housing. Thank you, Speaker. Our government for the people is taking action so more families of children with autism uh, can get the, uh, the services that they deserve. Over the next 18 months, over 23,000 families will move off the wait list and get the help that they deserve. You know, I, again, Speaker, our government inherited a system that was unfair and unsustainable. Our minister and the members of our government are committed to ensuring that over the next 18 months that we'll, Order. we will uh, clear that wait list. Our government's plan is built out of compassion, and, and we, we want to make sure that, again, uh, we, we are responsive to, to the needs of parents, but we can't have an unsustainable system where three out of four children languish Response. on the wait list. That's not fair. That wasn't a good system. We're going to change that, Speaker. Speaker, I'm sitting right here. Next question. Member for Scarborough-Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. The Premier said that he wanted a used van 
But thanks to court records, we know that this is not true. What the Premier really wanted was a custom van, fit out with a 32-inch screen television, a Blu-ray player, a leather-powered reclining bench, a mini-fridge and Wi-Fi. The used van was supposed to cost over $50,000, not including the actual cost of the van. This is the real gravy train. We learned that what the Premier really wants is a hand-picked select side, OPP order. detail. Why doesn't he trust the OPP detail that he was assigned? What doesn't he want them to see? We learned all this thanks to a whistleblower, Question. a man with a 33-year public uh, record of service to our provincial police. But we now know that the Premier's hand-picked deputy minister has fired him. Why the cover-up, Mr. Speaker? Cover up. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw her own parliamentary comment. I withdraw. Questions to the Deputy Premier? To the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker. Uh, to be clear, there is no used van. There is no van. What we have is a decision made by the Public Service Commission that the individual whose employment was terminated by OPP on Monday clearly had a different agenda that did not match with his oath of office. And I will quote again from his dismissal letter. You have acted in a manner that is incompatible with the faithful discharge of your position as a public servant. We cannot have individuals who have an agenda because they didn't get the job that they applied for undermining the excellent work that our order. OPP officers do every day across the, members come to order. the province of Ontario. Spons. Speaker, Mr. Blit. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, we need to know what the real agenda is. Again, to the Deputy Premier, our Can Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom protects legal rights and allows us to remain free from a police state. Why do you think that the Premier is running the OPP as his own private police force? Mr. Speaker, make no mistake, a Premier taking control of the OPP in this way is a big red flag. The Premier is undermining the rule of law. How is any Ontarian expected to believe that this force is independent when the Premier is using them in this way? He's fired the whistleblower and tried to cover up the purchase of a luxury van. And Once again, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw the unparliamentary comment and place her. Mr. Speaker, he is, he is having his personal, his staff use their personal. So, sorry. You have to withdraw the unparliamentary comment and please place your question. Is having his staff use their personal emails to carry out this order. When will this Premier do the right thing, not hire Ron Tavener, and fire Mario? Thank you. Thank you. Minister to reply. You know, why is your question? Speakers, I've, I've heard a lot of questions. I've, I've heard a lot of questions in this chamber in the last uh, 10 years. And as a former Minister of the Crown, it amazes me that this member is suggesting that the nine-member Public Service Commission is in any way influenced or impacted by, by uh, political decisions. You know, to be clear, the commission made a decision. Re the commission made a decision, Speaker, to terminate Mr. Blair's employment with the OPP as a result of him no longer being a member of the OPP because, quote, you have acted in a manner that is incompatible with the faithful discharge of your position as a public servant. Response. His order in council was rescinded. This is an individual who is using his office as a deputy commissioner in the OPP for personal gain and a personal agenda because he didn't get the job. Thank you. 
Next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Attorney General, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we respect the work done by the police officers. We know that they are everyday heroes and they protect our communities. Last month, last month the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services tabled a very important bill, Bill 68, to change the police officers' roles. We work with other partners of public safety to correct Bill 175 from the Liberal government, which is the most anti-police bill that we've known in Ontario. Our police officers deserve our respect. Our government wants to protect our officers, and it is an absolute priority. The Attorney General, could she tell us what our officers are telling us ab about the changes tabled by our government. Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the uh, Mississauga Centre MP. If our bill is uh, carried, it will offer clarity and transparency to officers, to police uh, chiefs, and to the population of Ontario. It would concentrate uh, investigation resources where we need them to help our communities. Bruce Chapman, chief of the association in Ontario, said that his members are very happy of this bill. And I cite him. The uh, members in uniform need uh, adequate uh, resources to protect our communities. We repeated our support to a, an efficient system based on transparency and responsibility to restore the public trust. Mr. Speaker, our government is determined uh, to keep uh, safety in our communities and to give our police officers uh, the tools they need uh, to accomplish uh, their very important work. Supplementary. Thank you, Madam uh, Minister. I'm happy to hear that our government listened to the officers' concerns. I believe that this new bill is uh, stable respectful and equitable. I know that the first-line officers in my community in Mississauga and everywhere in Ontario will be happy about these changes. The changes uh, uh, tabled by Bill 68 will make sure uh, that we uh, respect our officers and our citizens. On this side of the House, we know that the women and the men in uniform are, have high training and they risk everything for our safety. Will the attorney, attorney General tell us how the changes uh, to uh, the uh, special units, investigation unit, will improve the lives of our officers? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government knows that women and men in uniforms are everyday heroes to offer clarity and transparency to the population and the officers, we would uh, clarify the SIU mandate. If it's uh, carried, this bill uh, would concentrate its resources on criminal activities within uh, police uh, oversight, which is transparent and efficient. Uh, the bill would make it clear for every case where there is an obligation where, let's say, detention, use of force, and uh, in, uh, when there is a person who's deceased or greatly harmed, or when there's a sexual assault. This bill meets the needs of all of Telic, Judge, Judge Telic's recommendations. Thank you. Next question. Member for Brampton North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Over the weekend, over the weekend, there was a violent incident at the Toronto South Detention Centre that resulted in eight correctional staff being injured. Two were sent to hospital. Yesterday, staff withdrew all non-essential services in reaction to the violence. Minister. 
There has been a crisis in corrections for a long time. The last Liberal government did nothing about it. What actions are this government going to take to fix the corrections, the crisis in corrections? Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you for the question. And uh, it was a very serious incident on the weekend. And I think we really need to appreciate as legislators uh, what legislation, policies, uh, how they impact people on the front line. You know, we, we often talk in this chamber about very lofty ideas about how we want to make society better, but now we need to make sure that those, those changes that we make don't actually, actually impact or, frankly, hurt the individuals who are working in our institution, the people who visit our institutions, and the people who are serving in our institutions. Uh, we are actively engaged in those uh, discussions right now. We've already made some, some changes that uh, have been a positive Response. impact. But this is not an easy ship to move. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts when you're talking about corrections and the impact that the justice file have. That is, frankly, why the Ministry uh, Attorney General and myself worked uh, together to make sure that changes that happen in the Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. What is Howard Safers, in his report on the state of Ontario correctional system, called the Toronto South Detention Centre the most violent correctional facility in the province. Wow. The problems aren't mysterious. Safers was clear. The shifts where the most violence occurred were the shifts where they were understaffed. Instead of hiring casual, part-time, on-call staff to fill vacancies left by full-time correctional staff, will the minister commit today to hiring full-time correctional staff at the levels needed to effectively manage our troubled correctional facilities? Minister, members, please take their seats. Minister to reply. If I, uh, I will put the excellent training and work that our corrections officers do across Ontario up against any institution worldwide. I think that we have excellent people doing excellent work. We as legislators need to make sure that we give them the tools to ensure that Order. they stay safe. This is about a system that Opposition includes the Attorney General, a system that includes the Ministry of Health, a system that includes all of us as legislators to make sure the changes that we make actually improve the system, give the corrections officers the tools they need to stay safe. But there is no one who is more proud Opposition of the corrections Member for Niagara Falls the province of Ontario than our government. Thank you. Next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. And how important, how crucial it is that all Ontarians have the utmost confidence in the independence of the OPP and the appointment process for the OPP Commissioner. The dismissal of Brad Blair after he revealed his concerns raises some questions. The issue that remains unresolved at this point is the process that led to the disciplinary charges being laid in front of the Public Service Commission. Yes or no, did the minister have any conversation with Deputy Minister Di Tommaso about the conduct of Brad Blair since the revelations last December. The Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. When my Deputy Minister sent a letter as the ethics officer uh, on December 28th, of course, I was notified. I was made aware that there were concerns that an individual who did not receive the uh, position or offer uh, was upset and was using his office inappropriately. So 
um, in, to point to clarity, again, I will, I will lead you to the dismissal letter that was given to Mr. Blair and made public today. You have acted in a manner that is incompatible with the faithful discharge of your position as a public servant. Quote, this is also a contravention of your obligations under the conflict of interest regulation. Quote, it is a clear attempt to use your provincial status, your professional status to further your private interest yes. by implying that the legal activities in which you are engaged. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. So from the answer, I gather that she supported the laying of disciplinary charges against Bill Blair. But my question also goes to the integrity of the entire process. By now, there has been so many allegations that the Premier wanted a new commissioner, a new commissioner that was a little bit more sympathetic to some of his concerns on transportation and on the staffing. Does she not agree that at this stage, any Ontarian will not have confidence in the appointment of Ron Taverner, and we need to go back to square one because it's crucial for Ontarians to have the utmost confidence that the OPP commissioner is not playing, is not supporting one side of the House, but will act in a completely neutral, apolitical way with integrity all Question. the time. That's what we need in Ontario, and I ask you to go back and look at this process again. Minister to reply. Thank you, Speaker. I think uh, that the member, as a lawyer and a legislature, legislator, would also agree that no one is above the law. Whether you are a constable, whether you are a commissioner, whether you are a member of provincial parliament, you swear an oath to uphold the laws of this province. Clearly, Mr. Blair chose not to do that when he used his personal position as a deputy with the Ontario Provincial Police to try to bolster his argument that he should have received the job. I, I, uh, you know, I cannot understand how you don't get, he cannot use his uniform and his position as a deputy commissioner to further his own personal gain. This was a clear violation of his trust and Response. the trust we place in the Ontario Provincial Police. Thank you, Speaker. Next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, but applause is well deserved. But, uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transport. Our government for the people is committed to ensuring we are supporting our small rural communities across Ontario because they tend to lack the population base or resources to support a public transit system like the urban areas. I know the Minister represents rural areas, as do I and many of my PC colleagues. We understand that rural communities need support from all levels of government to continue to thrive, but also to get their residents to and from where they need to go. We value our municipal partners working collaboratively with them to deliver the best possible service to Ontarians across this province. Our government for the people was elected on that promise to get people moving, and we are doing just that. Can the minister share Question. more about how our government is working with our municipal partners and getting the people of Ontario moving again? Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from uh, Sarnia Lambton for that great question. It's great to be a colleague with him uh, over these past eight years, and he's such a champion for the people of Sarnia Lambton. And, and he's, he's also the master of private members' business. We should all take a lesson how Bob can work on both sides of the House and get his bills passed. It's great of him to do that. Mr. Speaker, as the member mentioned, I do represent Elgin Middlesex, London, which has many of the gems of this province in rural Ontario. Our government for the people is committed to continuing to work with and support municipalities and rural communities across the province. That's why I was pleased to announce just recently our government for the people's support of the transit projects across smaller communities across this province through the Community Transportation Grant Program. This program is making life better for people throughout rural and northern Ontario because they have Response. access to fewer public transportation options. Mr. Speaker, I will speak more of this in the supplementary. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, uh, Speaker, and through you and to you, thank you to the member uh, for that answer and for his ongoing support of solar communities and municipalities. It's great to hear that our government for the people is yet again working with municipalities to support those programs that help Ontarians stay connected in their communities. The previous government, propped up by the NDP, had 15 years to find a solution on, on this province and transit and failed. The only thing the Liberals and NCC Order. seemed to be good at was racking up a $15 billion deficit. The people of Ontario, uh, especially those in rural Ontario, cannot afford the delays in financial mismanagement of a previous government. I know my community of Sarnia Lambton was thrilled to hear about the announcement of the Community Transportation Grant Program. Can this minister please share more about this great program? Yeah. Minister. Thanks again for that question, Mr. Speaker. Our government for the people is working with smaller community support programs that will help Ontarians. One, stay connected with their communities, access employment and social programs, attend appointments, visit friends and families, and maintain an independent and active lifestyle. Over five years, the program will provide $30 million to 39 municipalities. Missing Pallies will use this provincial funding to partner with community organizations to coordinate local transportation services. This is yet another example of our government for the people keeping its promise to get Ontario moving. Since the inception of the program, more than 28,000 people have used new services to make more than 105,000 trips. Our government for the people is committed to getting the people of Ontario moving, and we are just doing that across the province, which is more than the previous government, supported by the NDP, did over their 15 years in office. Mr. Speaker, we're proud of our work so far in the transportation file. We're proud of working with rural and northern Ontario, and we're going to keep on doing this over the next four years. Next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. York Region and GO buses used to travel to the centre of York University, but now these buses drop people off at a TTC subway stop up to three kilometres away. Thousands of students and workers now must make an unfair and costly choice. Pay another fare to ride just one or two subway stops or walk up to three kilometres in the cold. And this is hurting people like Bonnie Cormier from Whitby. Bonnie's commute has increased by up to 40 minutes a day and she has to pay extra for worse service. She also has to pay extra for childcare because she now has to drop her 14-month-old off early and picking up, uh, pick him up late because of his, her longer commute. Minister, when are you going to show leadership and bring back the buses to York University? Yeah. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you for that question. And uh, uh, we do take uh, issues that you have raised, like Bonnie's, uh, quite seriously. But uh, just to be crystal clear to this House, uh, York University are the ones that requested GO buses be removed from their campus. Uh, we uh, did so after their direction, Mr. Speaker. Only after Metrolink advocated on behalf of students and computers did York University agree for the bo buses to come back until the end of January. But they have now left. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, York University was all for removing these buses until staff and students uh, protested the fact that they removed these buses. And Mr. Speaker, York University was unable to provide a safe access for where these buses would resume services. So we are ongoing, Metrolinx and York University, discussing how we can get these buses back to the campus. Uh, we only wish uh, we had more of a Response? willing partner with York University to find a solution that we need. Yeah. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, York University has a very different understanding of the problem, Minister. Uh, and what we also know is that this is a transit problem that has been going on for six months. And people like Bonnie and thousands of people like her are paying higher fares for worse service. You are the Minister. You can fix this problem. Tell Metrolinx to return bus service back to U York University and move forward on fair fare integration so that riders who use two different local transit systems don't have to pay a double fare. Minister, when will you direct Metrolinx to return service to York University? The Minister to reply, I'm going to remind all members to please make your comments through the chair. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back to the member. W to f solve this problem, Mr. Speaker, we, we actually need to have two partners willing at the table to find a, a solution. Metrolinx is sitting at the table willing to put a solution forward uh, that would be acceptable to the staff and students at, uh, at York University. Uh, asking buses to come back to the campus but not on the bus loop doesn't make any sense as there are no other safe 
alternatives for the students and staff to get off, Mr. Speaker. We're willing to sit down and work with this. I, I would hope the NDP isn't using this as an opportunity to politicize a situation which can be solved at the table. And uh, We're looking forward to Metrolinx to continue working with York University to find a solution. We want to find a solution to this problem, Mr. Speaker. It, it, we will find a solution to this, Mr. Speaker. We just need York University to sit down uh, and, and work with Metrolinx on that solution, and it's going to happen uh, as long as York University is willing to work with this government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for King Bond. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Last evening, the Prime Minister held a rally to promote his government's intention of placing a carbon tax on families, on workers and on seniors of this province. The Trudeau carbon tax will place a burden on the people of Ontario, costing up to $1,000 per household and as high as $5,000 in the future. Yet the Prime Minister claims that this tax will put more money back into the pockets of Ontarians. Speaker, I do not trust any politician that promises a tax hike will ultimately lead to tax savings. <laughs> to our Prime Minister, stop offending the intelligence of Canadians. We do not trust your government. We have lost confidence in this government, and we believe Canadians, including former members of your own cabinet, demand greater transparency from this government. Hey, 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 hey. So, to the minister, can you outline the true cost and economic consequence of the Trudeau carbon tax? Good question. Minister of the Environment, Conservation, and Parks. Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member for King Bond, and again, he's a great, great representative uh, for his constituents here. In this hey, hey, hey. Mr. Speaker, I, I do understand that the Prime Minister received a bit of a mixed reaction last night, even among a partisan crowd. And perhaps that's because even partisan Liberals know that a carbon tax is going to hurt families. They know that a carbon tax will have a direct impact on families and businesses. A carbon tax will cost the people of Ontario more to fill their cars, to feed their families, to heat their homes. It's bad for families, bad for jobs, and bad for investment. Higher costs, less jobs, and lower investment. Mr. Speaker, if that's not a recipe for a recession, I don't know what is. If the Trudeau Liberals are interested in a plan, then they can take a good look at ours, see that how we will meet the targets they set, the Paris targets, but not do it without a job-killing, recessive carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, we stand with the people of Ontario and we'll use all the tools at our disposal to fight the Trudeau carbon tax and to protect them. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. And I appreciate he's made clear that this government intends to fight climate change without placing an expensive tax on the people of this province. Our party is proud to have a strong record of advancing conservation here in Ontario. The party that created and protected the Oak Ridges Moraine. The party that expanded park space in Ontario by the single largest amount by the Living Lands Program. The party that initiated the first closure of a coal-fired gas plant in this province. We did all of this without imposing higher taxes on seniors, on families, and the future prosperity of this province. Yeah. Speaker, while middle-class families will pay the price, the Prime Minister cut a special carbon tax side deal with Canada's largest emitters that mean that they will continue to pollute for free while families and small businesses get hit with the full force of this tax. Yeah. Minister, what are the next steps you're taking Question. to fight this tax while making sure we protect our environment for the next generation? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for his question. Our government is committed to reducing greenhouse gases. That's why we brought forward our Made in Ontario Environment Plan that will work with Ontarians to have a balance of a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Mr. Speaker, we've already brought forward some key pieces of this, uh, of this plan for, uh, for consultation. Mr. Speaker, we have brought forward our, our plans to increase the uh, increased renewable content in gasoline to 15 per cent in order to reduce emissions. As I mentioned last week, we've brought forward our plans to have big polluters pay to make sure that there are emission standards that are tough but fair on polluters. And Mr. Speaker, as I've also mentioned in this House, I will be bringing forward our plan on waste, a plan that will reduce organics going into landfills, which will reduce harmful methane, which is also a dangerous greenhouse gas. Response. Mr. Speaker, this province deserves a plan that balances a healthy economy with a healthy environment. That's the plan we're bringing forward, and we're bringing it forward without a carbon tax. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Kiwetanong. 
Miigwech, uh, Speaker. Uh, the question is to the Deputy Premier. It's been uh, three years since the uh, Chief of Grassi Narrows First Nation called for an investigation into the mercury poisoning uh, of the soil in the river. A retired uh, mill worker in Dryden said uh, he helped dump 50 barrels of salt and mercury behind the mill in 1972, and he had identified a spot. The government's own environmental experts uh, recommended the cleanup uh, in the area over a year ago. But this week, the Toronto Star uh, reported that this, uh, this government and the Liberals before them have not taken any action to find the barrels. How long does, will it take this government to dig and clean up this toxic dump before more people from grassy narrows are poisoned? The Deputy Premier. With environment, conservation and parks. Referred to the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, through you to the member, and I, I do thank him for the question, our government is committed to the health and safety of all of our communities. Mercury contamination in the English and Wagaboon Rivers has profound impact on the communities and has to be properly addressed. We're committed to continuing to address this issue with the communities involved. As the member knows, there's a tripartite group, including the Wind First Nation and the Grassy Narrows First Nation, and we're working collaboratively with that group. Mr. Speaker, I visited Grassy Narrows and, and Chief Tuttle in October of, uh, of last year in, in Grassy Narrows. We made it clear that once we had the science, we would meet with them further, and that science was concluded in December. The results of that have now been communicated to the working group, which includes all three First Nations. And uh, on February 7th, I sent a letter to Chief Tuttle in this regard. We'll continue to work with the Grassy Narrows uh, First Nations Band, also with the Wind First Nations Band, to ensure that this issue is addressed. Supplementary. The children, the youth, elders of uh, Grassy Narrows First Nation live downstream from the Dryden Mill and eat fish from the Wabagoon River. If uh, poison was buried in Toronto, you can be sure that this Absolutely. government would act. Yes. After more than 200 days in uh, power, it is time for this government to take action to find the buried mercury upstream from grassy narrows, like they would for other communities in this province. Deputy Premier, why the double standard? <laughs> when, when will grassy narrows have answers? The community is waiting. Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for, question, for his question. Let me assure you in this legislature that we are concerned about the health and safety of every community. That's why I visited Grassy Narrows. That's why I met with Chief Tuttle. That's also why I met with Chief Pasek. We are working cooperatively, as the tripartite agreement calls for, to make sure that once the science was confirmed, we will then go forward with a study. And that's what the working group will be focused on. So we are working with the local communities. We are working with the affected individuals to protect the health and safety of that community, and we'll make sure that that is a priority for this government. The time for question period has expired. Member for Scarborough Guildwood on a point of order. Thank you so much. I'd just like to welcome some members from Scarborough here today Kingsley Kwok, uh, Anton Paul from my riding, and Bre Brenda Allen and Drew Finocone, who are with OPSU uh, Health Services. Okay. Point of order. The member for Ottawa Vanier in a point of order. Thank you, Monsieur le Président. I'd like to correct my my record. It's uh, Brad Blair and not Bill Blair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that concludes question period. As I said, I beg to inform the House that pursuant to Standing Order 98C, a change has been made to the order of precedence on the ballot list for private members' public business, such that Ms. Lindo assumes ballot item number 60, and Ms. Fife assumes ballot item number 73. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa Vanier has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Concerning the dismissal of Mr. Blair and the appointment of Mr. Taverner, this matter will be debated today at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 31 relating to allocation of time on Bill 68 with respect to community safety and policing. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Members will please take their seats. On March 4th, 2019, Ms. Thompson moved Government Notice of Motion No. 31 relating to allocation of time on Bill 68. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Bethlehem Falvey. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Ms. Mulrooney. Ms. Mulrooney. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Tabolo. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Calandra. Mr. Calandra. Ms. Serma. Ms. Serma. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Mr. Parsons. Ms. Skelly. Ms. Skelly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Ms. Triantafilopoulos. Triantafilopoulos. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Cusindo. Ms. Cusindo. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Mrs. Carhalias. Mrs. Carhalias. Mrs. Fee. Mrs. Fee. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith Peterborough Court. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Y. Mrs. Tang. Mrs. Tang. Mr. Baum. Mr. Baum. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Sandu. Mr. Guzzetto. Mr. Guzzetto. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Canapati. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Babiki. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Tiny Gasol. Mr. Tiny Gasol. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Shubisson. Mr. Shubisson. Madame Jelen. Madame Jelen. Mr. Tab. Mr. Tab. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Satler. Ms. Satler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Carpoche. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Lindo. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Ms. Burns McGowan. Ms. Burns McGowan. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Arthur. Mr. Bourguin. Mr. Bourguin. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morris. Ms. Morris. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Rokosov. Mr. Hard. Mr. Hard. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hassan. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. The ayes are 61, the nays are 42. The ayes being 61 and the nays being 42, I declare the motion carried. We now have a deferred vote on government notice of motion number 32 relating to allocation of time on Bill 66, an act to restore Ontario's competitiveness by amending or repealing certain acts. Call in the mem Same vote. Same vote. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The ayes are 61, the nays are 42. The ayes are 61, the nays are 42. I declare the motion carried. This House stands adjourned. Or, sorry, in recess. This House stands in recess. <laughs>